Muy buenas tardes. Uh, good evening. Bienvenidos. Welcome to the Instituto Cervantes Manchester and Leeds YouTube channel. It is a great pleasure for us to be here to commemorate one of the greatest Spanish uh, philosopher of the 20th century in Spain, Maria Zambrano, on the 30th anniversary of her death and uh, to celebrate that uh, with a seminar organized by Dr. Beatriz Caballero from the University of Stagg in Glasgow. Maria Zambrano was born in Vélez, Málaga in, uh, and studied philosophy under the influence of José Ortega y Gasset. And later she taught metaphysics and at the University of Madrid. Supported of the Republic, the Second Republic in Spain in the 30s, uh, later, after the Spanish Civil War, she went into the exile, living in France, Mexico, uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Switzerland, and Italy, to return to Spain only in uh, 1984. Her works had been uh, recognized in Spain in the last part of the 20th century with the Prize of Asturias Award in 1981, and the prize of, uh, is the, uh, of Miguel de Cervantes in 1988. Maria Zambrano is associated with poetic reason because it is her greatest uh, contribution to intellectual history. Situated as the intersection between philosophy, literature, and mysticism, the poetic reason is above all Zambrano's answer to the crisis of Western thought and civilization. But what is really a uh, poetic reason? It is an easy question, but with so many different uh, complex answers. To answer to this question, uh, we will have tonight Beatriz Caballero, who will analyze the horizon of poetic reason. And however, on contrary with, to what the, lit, the title might suggest at first glance, the poetic reason is not a form of philosophy or poetry. So what is it really? This first session will attempt to answer this question by discussing the background, aims, and key features of poetic reason in Maria Zambrano's thought. Let me now to introduce the speaker, uh, Beatriz Caballero Rodriguez is a senior lecturer at the University of Starlight in Glasgow. She's author of uh, several books and articles on the 20th century history of ideas in Spain, particularly in the areas of memory, trauma and exile and political philosophy. Her publications include two monographs against instrumental reason Neo-Marxism and Spirituality in the Thought of Jose Luis López Aranguren and Jesús Aguirre, and most recently, Maria Zambrano, A Life of Poetic Reason and Political Commitment. So please don't forget to write your comments or questions at, uh, in our account uh, Twitter using the hashtag at Zambrano uh, Instituto Cervantes, and Professor Caballero will be delighted to answer and to discuss with you. So I hope you will enjoy the lecture, I am sure. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here tonight. Hello, and welcome to this two-part series on Maria Zambrano. Thank you for joining me here today. And thank you as well, especially to the Instituto Cervantes for making this possible. Uh, in the course of these two sessions, we will have a chance to discuss Zambrano's thought and, in particular, her poetic reason. Let me um, take a minute to share the PowerPoint with you that we will be using in the course of um, today's session. Here it is, just so that you can see um, the title as well. So um, my goal during this time is to help you learn more about what poetic reason is and how it works. And most importantly, I will, I will be making the case that thinking in terms of poetic reason uh, may still result in some valuable insights even today. But before we do that, I would also like to start um, by addressing the question, who was Maria Zambrano? 
Perhaps the first striking feature about Maria Zambrano is that she was a philosopher and a woman at a time when women had very limited access to education, let alone to university education and a philosophical career. She was born in a small village in southern Spain in 1904. And to give you a sense of context, the illiteracy rate in Spain around the 1900s was um, for the general, for the population at large, it was over 60%. But if you look specifically at women, now we're talking about over 70%. So it is indeed remarkable that she attended university to study philosophy and what's more, that she would even teach it. However, I would like to emphasize that her accomplishments go far beyond that. As events in Spain and in Europe unfolded, she became increasingly critical of the dominant philosophical tradition. She was not alone in doing this. In an effort to understand the causes behind the atrocities of World War I and World War II, including how seemingly rational and moral human beings could commit unspeakable atrocities, unspeakable acts against other human beings, many 20th century philosophers questioned and criticized the rationality within which society and individuals operate. Um, and that was this, this rationality was um, largely blamed for, the, uh, for this outcome, for this terrible outcome. Uh, the Frankfurt School in particular comes to mind. Authors like Herbert Marcuse, uh, Theodor Adorno, Marx Horkheimer, uh, they were all pioneers in um, criticizing these uh, reason as a, as a um, well, Marcuse famously uh, described it as a one uh, dimensional form of reason uh, leading to a one dimensional man. Um, but um, I think they, they all agreed uh, in one shape or, or, or another that there was something fundamentally wrong with uh, that form of rationality because of its outcomes, but there was something fundamentally wrong in its principles that it would eventually lead to those outcomes. Um, however, as you probably know, uh, the Frankfurt School um, has also um, suffered numerous criticisms because of its pessimism. pessimism. They largely stayed at the level of the critique. However, they failed to develop a, an alternative, an alternative rationality or uh, a, a, path, uh, a pathway out of, of, that, um, of that problem. Um, and, and this is precisely what Zambrano set out to do. So what is deeply original about Maria Zambrano's thought is that she went beyond that criticism and developed her own alternative framework of rationality. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about her Raton Poetica, in English, Poetic Peace. Um, however, in order to fully understand uh, poetic reason, um, it's, in, it's important to, uh, to put it in the larger context. It's important to pay attention to the circumstances of Zambrano's life, and in particular, to her long exile. Zambrano actively sided with the Republic during the Spanish Civil War, and consequently, when the Republican side lost the war against uh, the Francoist forces, then Zambrano, alongside other thousands uh, of uh, Republicans, felt that she had to go into exile. And so this exile uh, lasted for over 40 years, and it took her through a long list of countries in Latin America and in Europe. And her thought, the development of her thought is closely tied together to this long exile. So um, in my opinion, uh, there's no question that Zambrano lived a fascinating life, although undoubtedly a dramatic one. So to learn more about uh, Zambrano's life and work in general, I encourage you to follow the link that the Instituto Cervantes has made available to a prior um, to a prior seminar where um, I discuss um, her life and her work in more detail. But for today, what I would like to focus on particularly is her poetic reason. So let's do that. Although the name Maria Zambrano will forever be linked 
to poetic reason, and rightly so, this does not mean that poetic reason is present in all of her work. In other words, poetic reason is not something that Zambrano came up with in her early career, but something that she would find um, later and develop in time. To put it differently, poetic reason is not a product. Rather, it started more as an aspiration than as a result. And it would not be until her mature work, uh, that is roughly until the late 1950s onwards, that she would start to produce poetic reason herself. That is, it's not until that date that we would see it in practice applied in her own writings. So um, this goes a long way to explaining the paradox contained in its name, poetic reason. Uh, what I mean here is that um, there is a paradox in so far as poetic reason, it's neither a form of reason or a form of poetry. So why call it poetic reason then? Well, because it refers to that aspiration. It refers to the intuition that whatever it is that she was searching for um, should uh, move somewhere within those coordinates, bringing together poetry and reason. And we will see this in a lot more detail later. Um, so for now, let's go back to the question, what is poetic reason? And in order uh, to answer this, it is useful to start by putting it in the context of what she was reacting against. And poetic reason starts uh, more than anything else as a reaction against the perceived failings of the established dominant rationality. In other words, against the reason of the enlightenment. And this becomes very clear from um, uh, her very first book. Her first book is entitled Horizonte del Liberalismo, Horizon of Liberalism, and it was published in 1930 um, when she was in her mid 20s. So she was quite young at the time, but we can see already that the uh, that the seeds of what would develop later on um, are already firmly planted. We can see here um, almost um, a, a program, uh, not something as organized as a program, but she gives us a very clear map of the direction in which she intends to move forward. Um, and so the main argument in this book is that the social and economic principles uh, imbued in liberalism as we know it today, do not support the ideals of liberalism. In other words, they do not support personal freedom and fulfillment. Um, so instead, at, at the same time, she, she's not willing to give up liberalism altogether, and she obviously um, defends the need for personal freedom and fulfillment. So what she does is that she advocates for a new kind of liberalism. Uh, however, um, she does not provide us with any details uh, of, of how this is to be accomplished. And I must admit, this is very typical of her, writer, uh, of her writing. She's not great on details and deliberately so. Okay, um, it's, it's one of the features of what she would develop later as poetic reason. And, um, and, and it's partly why she can be quite difficult to read, particularly her later work, but it's also uh, to a great extent what makes her so interesting and so fruitful, because um, she was very much a believer in sowing seeds that we could um, later pick up and um, develop in our own individual ways and interpret and reinterpret. And um, she, would, she would encourage us to build uh, different layers of meaning. So um, this is something that we're going to see a lot more of as her work progresses. And we will talk um, about this feature in particular in more detail in the second session. Um, for now, um, going back to um, Horizon of Liberalism, it's interesting to see how she closes this book with a stern criticism of reason, um, as well as with a hope for a new way of engaging with the world. This is what she says. So um, I'll read um, directly 
from a, a quote from a book. But before I do that, I would just like to point out that all the quotes included um, in these seminars come directly from uh, the compilation of Zambrano's uh, complete works, uh, which has uh, which has been published recently um, by um, in an, an edition by Galaxia Gutenberg, and the edition has its uh, the director is Jesus Moreno Sanz. It's very comprehensive and it comes with a whole lot of footnotes that provide a lot of contextual information and it's very helpful um, with the reading. So I highly recommend that. And, and the other, um, the reason, one of the reasons why uh, I mentioned that it's because I know it may a bit, it may seem a bit confusing if you go to, to the screen and you see the reference at the bottom, you will find the date Zambrano 2015. Well, um, clearly this wasn't, um, the original book wasn't published in 2015, but what often happens with Zambrano, it's, um, her books have suffered a number of editions and re-editions, and um, have been published many different times under in, in many different under many different guises. So sometimes extracts, sometimes the whole book, and it can it, it can it it, it 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 can become quite confusing. So the standardized way of referring to her works. Uh, it's the reference to the complete works. Now that they are finally available, it's making life much easier for um, academics working on Zambrano, and I think it's it's much clearer. So that 2015 refers to the, the edition of the complete works. The other thing I should mention is that um, uh, Zambrano is uh, notoriously difficult to translate, and the translation is my own. So um, apologies in advance for that. Um, so without further ado, I'll, what I'll do is and, and, and I'll do this uh, for the rest of the presentation. I'll read out the Spanish, which will always be on the left-hand side, but uh, you will have, you will find the translation on the right-hand side um, in, in case that's helpful. So um, I'll, I'll quote directly from, from her. Cuando la razón estéril se retira, reseca de luchar sin resultado y la sensibilidad quebrada solo recoge el fragmento, el detalle, nos queda solo una vía de esperanza, el sentimiento, el amor, que repitiendo el milagro vuelva a crear el mundo. So what we see here is um, a criticism of what she seems, uh, of what she identifies as being wrong with reason. And we see straight away that for her, reason is sterile. Um, it's not just sterile, but she considers that it's sterile because it's been um, um, fighting for something for a long time and uh, it hasn't yielded any results. And because of, of that, um, of, of that length of time that has passed because of that intent uh, of effort, it has lost its sensibility. Um, it, it has got lost in the detail and it has lost sight of the bigger picture. And so she considers that this needs a counterpoint and she says that there's hope and she puts her hope in, um, in love for now. Uh, she will get a lot more specific and we will see in later works how that hopes becomes poetry. Okay, so, so despite what it may seem after the harsh way in which uh, Zambrano deals with reason in her first book, um, she's not an irrational thinker. In other words, she's not willing to give up on reason altogether. Instead, she's searching for a different type of reason, one that it's life-affirming, and one that can be wider, that can encompass something bigger than uh, what she calls the esterile form of reason of the Enlightenment, the sterile form of reason of liberalism. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, we can see now how she's set on her path to look for uh, what that kind of reason would look like. It was not until 1937 
that is in the midst of the Spanish Civil War, that Zambrano would use the phrase poetic reason for the first time. But she wouldn't do so as part of reflections on her own philosophy. It wasn't part of a program uh, of, of an idea that she would develop later. Uh, rather, it was a comment rather uh, almost as if in passing, and it was in reference to a different author. In fact, it was in reference to Antonio Machado's poetry. What is interesting for us here is that she uses the phrase razón poética de honda raíz de amor, uh, poetic reason deeply rooted in love. So in other words, here we see echoes of um, her hope, of the hope she expressed at the end of Horizonte del Liberalismo. At the end of Horizon of Liberalism, if you remember, she was um, a very um, stern critic of um, the reason of the Enlightenment, but her hope lied very much in love. So what we now see is that she ties up love together with poetic reason. So um, even though it's not clear, not even to her, that this would become um, the core of her, her as, as I said earlier, the, her, her most significant contribution to the history of ideas. She didn't have this in mind at all at the time, but she had an intuition. She was playing around with the relationship between uh, the intuition that she wanted uh, poetry and reason to come together and uh, she felt that that should be deeply tied together to love somehow. And the key here, and I want to emphasize, I know that the words somehow don't usually make it into philosophical discourse, but I think this gives you a, a, a perhaps a more accurate representation of what was going on at the moment. This is why earlier on I underlined the concept of an aspiration. She, she knew that this, the direction she wanted to move towards, but she hadn't quite figured out yet how uh, that would take shape. So our next stop uh, in this journey is uh, Philosophiae Poesia. Uh, it is perhaps where the most important clues to trace poetic reason can be found. Um, this book was written, if you look at the date 1939, this uh, was written once the civil war had already ended. Maria Zambrano had already started her exile, and this was written while she was staying at the uh, at, at Mexico. You can see um, here in the front cover at the bottom how it says Publicaciones de la Universidad Michoacana Morelia. That is, it was published by the university at Morelia, uh, which is the Mexican city where she was uh, working at university at the time. Um, so it was published then. It was one of two books which deals precisely um, with the topic um, of philosophy and poetry, this one more specifically so, and um, the other one, it's more about its, um, its role in, in Spanish heritage. And, and, and this is particularly important uh, to better understand poetic reason, because um, Zamarano devotes the entire book to think about what philosophy is and what poetry is, um, and also to think about what they do, um, how they work, and particularly how they differ from one another. In other words, what, uh, the reason why this publication is important for us is because um, Zambrano, um, her thought, it's built upon the tension between these two poles, between philosophy and poetry. And what she's doing is that she's trying to get to the, uh, the basis of what they're all about, uh, to find out what, uh, how to position herself uh, and, and to better understand our, our heritage, our, um, the, the heritage of European philosophy. So in order to do that, she starts the book by imagining a time when philosophy and poetry stood together. And uh, she does this by underlying the fact that they both um, start off with the word. 
the word is essential. This is how they both communicate. This is how they're both possible. They both work with the word, but they do so in very different ways. So she's interested then in pinpointing just the precise time in which their relationship broke apart. And according to Zambrano, that exact moment can be found in Plato, to be precise, in Plato's Republic. So um, Zambrano explains how uh, Plato sets out to find truth and unity. And for him, truth um, was to be found in the ideas, in the world of ideas. And hence, uh, it is through philosophy that we can achieve knowledge, the knowledge of the ideas. Um, I'm, I'm not going uh, to go here into any depth regarding Plato's thought, but just um, with very broad strokes, it's, I think it's worth emphasizing uh, its importance because what Plato does is that he gives birth uh, he gives birth to dualism. That is the, the idea that we're so familiar with in our um, European uh, culture, uh, that um, and, and European philosophy in particular, that, um, that there is a division, that there's not just a distinction, but a sharp division between the sensory uh, world, the world that we see and interact with, and the world of ideas. And not just that, but Plato places truth, uh, not in the sensory everyday world, that for him is the world of appearances, but for him, truth can only be found in the world of ideas. So uh, if you want to uh, find out what beauty is, uh, it's not going to be found in, uh, by, by looking at particularly beautiful objects, because those are just reflections and appearances. Uh, beauty as a concept, uh, it's, it's where you would find the answer. It's through philosophy that you would find knowledge. And doing this uh, means specifically for Zambrano, that it is in Plato where we find uh, the, um, the banishment, the expulsion of the poets from the city. This is how she phrases it. In other words, what Plato does, uh, according to Zambrano, is that he condemns poetry because poetry is not so much concerned with the world of ideas, it's concerned with the world of the senses. In other, world, uh, sorry, in other words, Poetry is more about feeling than it is about thinking. And hence, for Plato, it cannot be relied upon. And it is precisely this what led uh, to the expulsion of the poets for Plato, because uh, they couldn't be relied upon. They, they wouldn't give us the way to knowledge. They wouldn't point the way to truth. It was just uh, poetry uh, because it's concerned with the senses, with the sensual, with the physical world. Um, it's also concerned with just appearances. Now, this is important because um, Zambrano uh, identifies Plato as the start of this way of thinking that marks um, the rest of European philosophy, what's, what's to come for, for the next uh, 2,500 years, um, roughly. And Zambrano is not the only one, incidentally, uh, to point these out. She's in good company. Um, so it's interesting to note how a British uh, philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, famously uh, also said that the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. Um, so much has been said about these for our purposes. I think it's interesting um, just to note that Plato uh, seems to be this turning point in which um, the way we uh, conceptualize reality changes. And that has a lot to do with that dualism, that sharp distinction between the world of the physical and the world of the mind, the, word, the world of the senses and the world of ideas. And so the world of ideas is the realm of philosophy, which seeks uh, the eternal, seeks the unchangeable, seeks a sense of unity. It's concerned with the concept of being, whatever that is, uh, but is abstract 
and, and, and philosophy stays very much in the abstract for most of the um, European philosophical tradition. Whereas Zambrano thinks that we are missing out a lot by giving, uh, by leaving behind the senses, by leaving behind emotion, by leaving behind um, a whole set of experiences that are part and parcel of being human and that philosophy seems to be looking down upon. And uh, in contrast, she considers that poetry embraces those experiences. And nevertheless, Zambrano is not willing to give up on philosophy altogether. And, and this is really the challenge. Part of the problem, as Zambrano puts it, is this. Pensamiento y poesía se nos aparecen como dos formas insuficientes. Se nos antojan dos mitades del hombre, el filósofo y el poeta. So, in other words, um, for Zambrano, philosophy and poetry are both insufficient independently from each other because they each represent one aspect, one side of the human being. Having said that, she's much more forgiven um, of poetry than she is of philosophy. And we'll see that clearly in this next quote. Here she says, En los tiempos modernos, la desolación ha venido de la filosofía y el consuelo de la poesía. So um, she's very critical of the times of, of, of her present time. And of course, she has good reason to be. Remember that this was written in 1939, right after the Spanish Civil War that led to her own exile. But this is also the year in which World War II broke out. So she has good reason to be critical of, uh, of the times she was living in. What is interesting for us is that she, uh, she blames philosophy of those outcomes. And as we said earlier, she's not alone in doing that. This is very common of philosophers. Um, 20th, many 20th century philosophers, Zambrano and also notably the Frankfurt School, um, people like uh, Herbert Marcuse, Horkheimer, uh, um, uh, Adorno, they coincided in pointing out that reason, uh, the established uh, rationality, that the reason of the Enlightenment um, was um, sick, was insufficient, was broken, and uh, that we were operating under those coordinates uh, which led to disastrous consequences. So Zambrano, independently from the Frankfurt School, also reached um, a very similar uh, conclusion, and she was blaming the Western philosophical tradition, so-called European philosophy. She blamed um, that kind of philosophy um, of the uh, outcomes that would um, that would uh, end up in, in the disastrous wars we're all familiar with uh, that marked and scarred the 20th century. In contrast with that, uh, in contrast with what she refers to as the proudness of uh, philosophy, um, proudness and, and its full negative context, uh, content of being overly um, proud. Um, it's proud almost as a sin, being, um, uh, not being humble, right? Um, in contrast with that lack of humbleness of philosophy, which um, thought itself as self-sufficient, um, she, she thinks that uh, consolation can be found in poetry instead. And so she emphasizes uh, the need uh, to find a reason, a kind of reason that would encompass both. So again, I would um, read out the, uh, the quotation for you. She says, La razón de la doble necesidad irrenunciable de poesía y pensamiento Sería sencillamente la salida a un mundo nuevo de vida y conocimiento. So she places her hope to a new world, a new way of gaining knowledge and of engaging with life um, to the um, marriage. She, she, her, her hopes are placed on the marriage of philosophy and poetry somehow. 
OK, and I emphasize here the, the word somehow because she doesn't set out of a plan of just how to do that. She does give us a hint, which is that she also envisages um, the sacred, the mystical um, as part of the mix. She thinks that that's another element which is also missing here. So um, she eventually um, further uh, on in the book, she offers uh, no answers. But she challenges us with a question that reads more um, like inspiration, an inspiration which, in my opinion, guides the rest of her thought. So what she um, asks is, ¿no será posible que algún día afortunado la poesía recoja todo lo que la filosofía sabe? Todo lo que aprendió en su alejamiento y en su duda para fijar lúcidamente y para todos su sueño? So here, she is a little bit more positive towards philosophy because she acknowledges that philosophy has gained knowledge. She, um, she is able to recognize that in its isolation from uh, other parts of experience, philosophy, um, by its exercise of um, doubt, and here we can see a wink towards uh, Descartes, um, philosophy has been able to, to reach a certain kind of knowledge, but um, she says that that knowledge needs to be picked up, collected by poetry in order to share it with the world, in order to illuminate um, the world uh, somehow. So, um, Whereas, if you remember um, Horizonte del Liberalismo, uh, which is a pre-war book uh, written in 1930, uh, there the ending was very hopeful. Um, however, she's, um, she's quite um, pessimistic about the possibility of that marriage uh, between philosophy and poetry ever um, taking place, or certainly not any time near from her point of view. This is what she says. Y su unión, la de la poesía, con la palabra, la de la razón, no parece estar muy cercana todavía, porque todavía no es posible pensar desde el lugar sin límite en que la poesía se extiende, desde el inmenso territorio que recorre errante. So, she's clearly pessimistic um, in that she is not able to, to see that that kind of union would take place anytime soon, but she does give us um, an indication, a clearer indication of what she is hoping for. So she's hoping to be able to tackle uh, philosophical questions, but within the realm of poetry, uh, within that uh, territory, the, within the space of poetry. And this is a big clue, and this is precisely what she sets out to do herself. So we have a very good idea by now of what it is that Zambrano is seeking, and we also know that uh, this aspiration, this search for a closer relationship between philosophy and poetry would shape the rest of her production, of her intellectual production. Um, however, one thing Zambrano does not do is to give us a definition of what poetic reason is. The closest we come to that, it's probably uh, a quotation that we get from one letter, from a letter that she wrote to a friend of hers, Rafael Dieste, in 1944. And bear in mind, this was never intended for public consumption. So it was never her intention to really set out to explain exactly what it is that poetic reason is. Um, however, she, she did try to intimate to this um, friend what it is that she was seeking, and she phrased it in the following way. She says, algo que sea razón, pero más ancho, algo que se deslice también por los interiores, como una gota de aceite que apacigua y suaviza, como una gota de felicidad. Razón poética es lo que vengo buscando y ella no es como la otra. Tiene, ha de tener muchas formas. Será la misma en géneros diferentes. So, this is um, already 
very telling in that she finally uh, it's putting the word razón poética in direct reference to her search, to her search for a reason, a kind of reason, something like reason, but wider. And she, um, it's, it's interesting how she the emphasizes, so she takes weight, she takes uh, the limelight from the realm of ideas uh, that has traditionally been um, linked to reason, and instead, she uh, embodies uh, that kind of reason um, into the human being, and she uh, she relates it to our inners, so our interiors. Um, nuestros también por los interiores. In Spanish, is also quite a vague uh, word. Um, I think what she and, and she is deliberately vague um, and what she's saying is something that brings peace, something that brings happiness. So she's already indicating that it has to be a reason that is not in the abstract. It has to be a reason that is embodied, that it takes place within the human being. And not just that, but it's a reason for, for peace, que apacigua, uh, meaning that it brings peace, that it softens, uh, that uh, at, at, to, it makes feels better. Uh, in, a, in a way that uh, it brings happiness. So it's a reason intended for the fulfillment uh, of uh, the human being. It's a life affirming kind of reason. Now, the other part, um, this is a, a very uh, well known quotation, and it is generally the first part that is more often quoted. The second part, um, what it says, ella no es como la otra, this is um, perhaps less um, well-known. And to, it, to my mind, it's just as interesting because this also contains valuable clues of what poetic reason is meant to look like, what, what, the shape it will eventually take. So what she says is that it's not like the other one. So it's not just going to be um, one-sided. It's not going to be unidimensional, to borrow a phrase from Marcuse, from Marcuse, sorry. Um, instead, it's, it's to have many uh, shapes. It's the same within different genres. So what she said, this is why uh, at the beginning, if you remember, I was saying poetic reason is neither a form of poetry is nor a form of reason. So I think from my point of view, to say that poetic reason is a kind of reason would be selling it short. I think that Maria Zambrano wants to incorporate reason uh, she certainly does not want to leave reason out. Um, she intends to be rational, um, but she intends to go beyond that. She is seeking for a framework that would enable us to continue to be rational in a richer sense. Uh, and, and that's why she's weaving in um, poetry, but also uh, mysticism, dreams, uh, the realm of emotions, uh, of uh, autobiography, so lived experience is also essential. Um, it's, a it's a complex world uh, that my, uh, from, from my perspective, what she's saying here, my interpretation of uh, it would be the same one, but with different genres, is that what she's proposing is a framework from which we can um, engage with reality, from which we can not just think, but to engage and interpret reality from that framework. And so by emphasizing that it would have different genres, she's saying it's not just a tool to do philosophy. It's, um, it's a framework, it's a frame of mind that you adopt in order to engage with the world, uh, in order to engage with the world um, in uh, regards to your philosophical experience, but also your aesthetic experience, your experience of the sacred, uh, your experience of the self, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's interesting how um, in the intimacy of a private letter, she does venture to try to communicate what poetic reason is. However, years later, in 1989, uh, this other book, Notas de un Metodo, 
Note of a Method was published. And uh, by this time, Zambrano was already exercising poetic reason in full. And it's interesting, the contrast, because despite the fact that Zambrano was already exercising poetic reason, nevertheless, she um, expresses here that it's incredibly difficult to talk about poetic reason, to explain what it is. And um, she puts it in the following um, way. She says, De la razón poética es muy difícil, casi imposible hablar. Es como si hiciera morir y nacer a un tiempo, ser y no ser, silencio y palabra, sin caer en el martirio ni en el delirio. So what she says here is that it's almost impossible to talk about poetic reason. The way she phrases it, it's, it reads as if it's almost painful. And she says that it's a kind of the effort of explaining what poetic reason is takes you right to the edge. It's almost as if you were going to experience contradictory um, events such as dying and being born at the same time. It's being and not being at the same time. It's putting together silence and the word at the same time, and yet doing all of that without going crazy. So I think she's very deliberately choosing contradiction here to tell us the wide range uh, encompassed by poetic reason, but also to give us an example of what it is uh, that it means expressing something without actually saying it. She's clearly conveying, this is an active example of what poetic reason looks like. She um, very definitely refuses to give us a philosophical explanation, a rational explanation of what, uh, of what poetic reason looks like. However, she's presenting it um, in an experiential way. She's telling us how uh, what poetic reason um, it's meant to make you feel like, or at least what the uh, what making the effort of explaining what poetic reason is making you feel like, um, to give you a sensory um, experience rather than a purely philosophical understanding, and and I think this really goes to the heart of what poetic reason is trying to do, um, and I think this is this is really uh, the takeaway. Uh, from this talk today, that understanding what poetic reason is cannot be detached from what poetic reason does. It's not just what it is in the abstract, because it's not meant to be abstract. It's not meant to deal just with ideas. It has to be understood as a kind of reason which is doing something, is generating an experience. It's, um, it's, it's conveying things. It's expressing uh, itself or its, uh, its author is expressing herself uh, by way of imagery, of symbolism, of metaphors, of contradictions. She's using all the tools in the um, poetic toolbox in order to deal with philosophical problems, but also in order to convey the complexity of the human experience. And so, and, and so I think that is very much the essence of what poetic reason not just is, but is doing. Okay, so let's recap. What is poetic reason then? Well, first of all, we've seen that poetic reason is born as a reaction against the Western philosophical tradition. And not just that, it's born um, as a reaction against the perceived consequences of that tradition, okay, the so-called European philosophy, that in the eyes of not just Zambrano, but many 20th century philosophers have ultimately led to the atrocities that have uh, marked that century, um, 20th, the 20th century. So it is a reaction, it is a, a, a criticism at its essence, but it's also um, a, not just an aspiration, it is born as an aspiration, but ultimately it becomes um, an alternative to uh, the very framework of rationality against which she is reacting. Okay, so um, how, is it built? Um, well, 
we've also been discussing how it is uh, an attempt to bring together philosophy and poetry and also religion or the experience of the sacred. I use here religion in um, a very loose um, way. Um, so I think what it is essential here um, for us to focus today is the marriage of between philosophy and poetry, because that is what lit quite literally shapes poetic reason. So um, poetic reason deals with the core questions that philosophy uh, tackles, or, or not just that, even, even some more, even, it, it even goes beyond that by also tackling uh, a number of other questions that Zambrano considers that philosophy should tackle and traditionally doesn't. And in order to do that, she uses uh, the strategies contained within poetry to, um, to enter it into a terrain which um, goes beyond what um, it's possible if you take reason alone, if you take traditional, um, the so-called, the, the European um, philosophical tradition. And she imbues um, her search for, um, for meaning, her search for truth, her search for, um, for that reason, she imbues that um, with, the, uh, with poetry. Okay. And we're going to um, see an, a, a number of examples of just how she does that and how it all comes together. So her uh, premise um, is she's starting from the premise that only by bringing those two together and also by infusing them with a sense of the sacred, only then can we, uh, first of all, approach uh, those key uh, longings that are typical of, um, hum uh, of being human, but also it's the only way in which we can overcome the limitations um, characterized within philosophy or the limitations of poetry by themselves. Um, now it gets trickier, so far so good, but she also tells us that it is nearly impossible, even painful to talk about it. So if we have a form of um, reason, a form of thought, but we cannot discuss it, what are we left with? Why can we not talk about it? And as it turns out, this is key. Uh, it is no coincidence, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. It is no coincidence that Zambrano underlies the difficulty and perhaps even the unwillingness to explain poetic reason because doing so for her would be a self-defeating exercise. In other words, entering into the realm of explanations, definitions, abstractions for her is tantamount to actually inhabiting the realm of philosophy. And this would defeat her purpose. She's not just about telling us how it would work in the abstract. Uh, she, her, her whole point, what she set out to do, is to do it, to show us how it can be done, how thinking and uh, uh, how you can think in an embodied way, how you can imbue thinking with emotion, uh, with feeling, with dreams, with delirium even, to go beyond the, lim the traditional limitations of reason. So there is another paradox uh, deep within poetic reason, which is that she's constantly attempting to say the ineffable. Um, she's trying to say that which cannot be said. And she chooses the tools of poetry uh, in order to do that. So she makes use of imagery, symbolism, metaphors, contradictions um, in order to tackle these questions. But also not just um, uh, to enable her to talk about things that are very difficult or nearly impossible, as she says, to talk about, but also in order to engage the reading, the, the reader. What she uh, does is that she uh, encourages the reader to read actively, uh, not just by wondering what Zambrano may have meant by that, but also by actively thinking what it means for them, what it feels like for them, okay? And, and this is uh, what poetic reason is all about. So in short, she does not create a system. She's anything but systematic, but that she does create a framework from which to 
communicate and from which to engage with reality in a different way. So let's, um, let's go back to the quotation that we saw uh, in notes of a method. Remember that she was saying that it's impossible, nearly impossible um, to talk about delirium without, sorry, to talk about poetic reason without falling into martyrdom. But um, the quote follows, uh, the, the quote goes on. And even though it's quite long, I think it's worth um, spending some time reading it, but also analyzing it together because I think it contains many clues. Again, it's paradoxical because Zambrano says that it's impossible to talk about it, but she does give us here the clues of what poetic reason sets out to do and how to do it, what it's all about. So let's, uh, let's read it um, together. Lo llamaríamos desamparo, tal vez. Error de perderse en la luz más aún que en la oscuridad. Necesidad de la respiración acompasada, necesidad de la convivencia, de no estar sola en un mundo sin vida y de sentirla, no solo con el pensamiento, sino con la respiración, con el cuerpo, aunque sea el minúsculo cuerpo de un animal pequeño que respira, sentir la vida y en eso que clama por ser dentro de la razón. So, let's take this step by step. I know um, it's a bit obscure, and remember that this is deliberate. She's trying not to be straightforward because um, that would be uh, philosophy. If she just said what she meant straight away, she would be entering into the realm of philosophy. But more importantly, she's not doing that just because she uh, doesn't want to do philosophy in the traditional way. She's doing that because she thinks that in simply explaining things, you're leaving the essential out. Okay, so she wants you not to just get it in an abstract way. She wants you to um, get a sense of, of what it is that she's saying. And I emphasize here the, the concept of sense. Remember when we were uh, discussing her first book, uh, Philosophy and Poetry, how she uh, described uh, the duality that Plato um, presented to us between uh, the world of ideas and so the sensory world. And for her, poetry uh, moves within the realm of the senses. So she's trying to recuperate that and to uh, link it back together with the realm of philosophy. So uh, this uh, is it's, uh, worth, I think, analyzing um, in smaller chunks because I think it's, it's packed full of meaning. So, lo llamaríamos de la desamparo. Would we call it helplessness? What is she referring to? This sense of, of not being to talk um, about poetic reason, this sense of being and not being that we were discussing uh, in, the, uh, in the previous sentence. She says, uh, I think what she's, con um, what she's conveying here is that it's not an easy path, but it's, uh, despite the difficulty that she's clearly underlying, um, she's also saying that um, it's not just um, being helpless. Perhaps there is something um, about that. There's an element perhaps of being vulnerable, of letting yourself be vulnerable. But uh, there is a reason for that and you need to go beyond, okay? And so what she's saying is that it is a mistake of becoming lost in the light. Now, this is a dig at the philosophy of the enlightenment. Okay, quite literally, this is why she uses the word light. She um, uses the metaphor of light very often because she considers that philosophy has all been about, um, about finding uh, some uh, ideas that you can analyze at the bright light of day and that would uh, resist uh, that uh, the, the dissection of reason. So it goes back to Descartes, who was in search of clear and distinct ideas. Zambrano uh, considers that to be uh, uh, an exercise uh, in, in proud. She thinks that it's being too proud of philosophy to think that uh, ideas can be so uh, self uh, assured. She thinks that uh, a sense of a certain sense of insecurity it's essential. And that's why she doesn't like uh, to, to, 
to stand in the bright light. She prefers the, she, she calls her, uh, her philosophy, she calls her thought, uh, the philosophy of the dawn, Aurora. Uh, that time of day, of day when just, just at daybreak, when um, the sun uh, hasn't still quite gone up, you can st uh, start to see some uh, early shy ray of light, but, but, but it's not, um, the day has not um, broken out. It, it's not clear, it's not entirely clear yet. It's that sense of um, the, the mixture between shadow and light um, that for her, um, it's the perfect metaphor for what knowledge should be about. You should have the sense that you are starting to understand something, but you should never be um, entirely convinced that you hold the whole truth, because the truth may be complex and reality is certainly complex and uh, knowledge is more um, a continuous search than a, a final result that you can just grasp. Um, if you think about it, our concept our contemporary concept of uh, perhaps science would probably agree with that. Uh, we, we may feel quite um, secure in the knowledge we have, but that is only under our current paradigm and science needs to keep revising the existing paradigm as new discoveries are made. Uh, this should also be resonant uh, with Socrates even, um, and uh, you know how philosophy um, sets um, has a before and an after. So we have the pre-Socratics and everything else came after Socrates. And the reason why, one of the reasons why Socrates is so important for philosophy is because um, he underlined the fact that uh, we have to start um, in our search from no for knowledge from the humbleness that, um, well, in his case, he underlined that he, he knew nothing, and that the only thing he knew was that he knew nothing, and we certainly all know very little, and that is something that Zambrano is keen to highlight as well. So all of that is, is already being hinted at in this sense of getting lost, lost in the light, and it, in contrast with that, which he considers a mistake, um, she says that oh mass so it's it's even more um, a, a, a mistake it's even more of a mistake to be lost <clears throat> excuse me in light rather than to be lost in darkness so <clears throat> clearly she values that darkness and, and the shadows <clears throat> she moves on to explain the need for um, for, for breathing uh, for rhythmic breathing so um, not to rush things, the need to take your time to do things um, at their own pace. And uh, this is important. Time plays a key role in Zambrano. And, and it's, the, it's about listening uh, to the passage of time and listening to the needs of time. Certain things must take their time and you cannot rush them. And Zambrano is all about listening to that time. And, and perhaps for us, um, one of the earliest measures of time is in our breathing. We have an inbuilt, um, as if it were, a chronometer um, through our breathing. Breathing, it's a way in and out. You can, you can see the passage of time that way. Thamrano finds many metaphors to, um, to let us know about the passage of time. Another one, a, a very early one, in which she says that time becomes visible is dust. For her, dust is the way in which you can see time because it settles into something physical. So it's interesting how we can see time and time again these uh, attempt to bring the abstract elements of philosophy into the physical to embody them. And that attempt becomes even clearer as these quotation um, progresses. So she talks about the need to live together, the need for coexistence. And this is also key for Zambrano, poetic reason must be an ethical reason. Um, uh, for her reason, it's no good if it ends up, in, if it leads to war, if it leads to destruction, it must be a life affirming reason. And it must be a reason um, which is based on, um, on how we live together, because um, there's no, um, for her, that the person uh, can only be 
uh, fulfilled um, in a system. Uh, and in fact, this is her definition for democracy. For her, democracy is the system which uh, not only uh, enables uh, the person to flourish, but uh, enforces, makes it compulsory almost for the person to flourish in a community. Okay, so it's about uh, also considering the other and knowing uh, of our interrelationship, interdependence even. So she emphasizes that there's no point of being alone in a world, in a lifeless world. Uh, we're not alone. And if, if we were, the world would be lifeless. So um, her philosophy, her um, poetic reason is something else. So what she's seeking is, and, and this is the second part of the quote. So she starts with what she's not about. And now she tells us what it is uh, all about. It's about feeling it, feeling life, uh, not just through thought, but uh, feeling it uh, embodied. How do you feel it embodied? The, the easiest, um, not perhaps easiest, because it's easy to forget about it, but the most immediate way to perceive life, of course, is through breathing, through our body, through remembering that we have a body. So I think what she's saying is that it's a mistake to um, rely on uh, entirely abstract ideas to guide our thought, to guide our life, because um, uh, we are embodied beings, okay? Um, not just human beings, but even the smallest of animals which breathes, that's what she means there. Um, and so what she's doing is she is um, claiming, uh, she is uh, urging us to feel life. And moreover, she's claiming, um, sorry, she's urging us to feel that kind of being which is within reason, but which um, needs uh, to, to be um, to be rescued, as if it were. Uh, she thinks that all of these elements uh, have a space within reason, but it's a space that has not been allowed to flourish so far. And that is the framework that she intends to create with her poetic reason. That's my interpretation of this um, quotation, as you can see, is packed with meaning. And uh, I'm sure that there will be other plausible uh, interpretations. And, and, and I think this is very much what poetic reason is about, is about reading the text and taking uh, different layers of meaning that it contains and analyzing them and reading and rereading them and what they mean for you as well. Right, so um, these also uh, serves as a good example to showcase the key features of poetic reason. So we've discussed this, the fact that poetic reason um, speaks in a poetic language. And what this means is that content and style go hand in hand in poetic reason. The two of them come, to get, come together and uh, we, we do well in considering them uh, as, uh, as, as a union because um, it's, it stops being poetic reason if we just focus on the idea it stops being poetic reason if we just focus on the poetic language. It has to be the combination of both, really. So why is that? Because uh, she embodies all, um, she's trying to convey with that all of these features. First of all, is a text that works uh, through layers of meaning, okay? It's not just one thing that, that it's saying, it has uh, many different layers. It has the literal layer, um, it has the metaphorical layer, but um, uh, those layers um, also may mean different things depending on, on the context, but also depending on your own experience, depending on the person who reads it. And by this, I don't mean that Zambrano's texts are relative and that they may mean anything. No, they do have a clear reference and, and, and they do have um, a, uh, a meaning, um, a set meaning, but because there are layers, uh, in addition to that, you can add uh, to those, uh, to, to that basic meaning, depending on your experience, and I think that's, that's the way it's being set up, so that it's, uh, it's linked to something else that she goes back to time and time again, which is the knowledge of experience. Uh, remember that she's very much against 
abstract um, against leaving everything in the abstract and she counteracts that by bringing it back to experience and she does that um, by going beyond reason and by using the tools of poetry so through symbolism through metaphor through um, through imagery she tries to link with the experiences of the reader um, so that what she communicates brings up uh, more uh, nuances for us. Okay, so where does this leave us? In my opinion, the best way of understanding poetic reason is to understand it as an alternative framework of rationality, a framework that she created in order to express and communicate human experience. She stays within the realm of rationality, but she also incorporates other realms traditionally um, left outside the boundaries of reason, such as the experience of the sacred, the aesthetic experience, dreams, intuitions, emotions, even delirium. According to Zambrano, the Western tradition has been attempting to explain the world and the human being relying solely on reason. In contrast, one way of looking at poetic reason is that it offers a framework that is more anthropomorphic, that is, a framework that better represents the shape of, of the experience of being human. Um, so that's all from me for today. Uh, next week, we will continue to deepen our understanding of what poetic reason is by looking at some extracts and some examples of poetic reason in action. I hope that you enjoyed today's seminar. Thank you for joining me and thank you to the Instituto Cervantes for making this possible. See you next week. <laughs>